I didn't know the words to that last verse. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Religious deception, part number three. Amazing time on the earth. God has spent some thousands of years building up the tradition of worship in Israel. And now he is departing from it, walking away from it. And it's causing a lot of problems in those who are truly devoted to him. In Matthew 23, 37, he begins to tell them about uh, their missed opportunity and how the temple is now left to them desolate. God's going to abandon it. We saw uh, that happening in uh, the book of, of Ezekiel, as God leaving uh, out of the temple and his glory departing from the city. And he says in verse 39 of chapter 23, you're going to have to come to be born again as individual sinners to ever say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And then in verse 1 of chapter 24, he goes out and departs from the temple. And his disciples are so astounded that uh, they begin to show him the things that they like about the temple. They just can't get away from it. It's hard to change. It was hard on a lot of people. Uh, John, uh, John had a problem with it weeping in Revelation chapter 5 because no one was worthy to open the book and to lead the church into the new era of the Christian faith until he was directed to the lamb that had been slain upon the throne. The Apostle Paul, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, he had a problem with it. Uh, <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1 Verse number 18, 17 maybe, let's see what it is. Galatians 1, yeah. He talked about God was pleased to separate him from his mother's womb and call him by his grace. Verse 15, he revealed his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Verse 17, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Paul was taken out into the Arabian desert and God had to undue him and make him to be formed to be a Christian. We need to make sure we're not Baptists only, but we are Christians. Somebody say amen. amen. I was a lost Baptist for seven years, but I was in good shape with the Baptists. I just wasn't saved. And uh, so the Apostle Paul had trouble with it. Uh, John is weeping, and the disciples here are trying to enhance the temple back to the mind of Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. God's serious about this thing, going to destroy it completely. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. There's a list of who it was in Mark chapter 13, I believe it is. Uh, and saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus is talking about his departing. They're talking about his coming. And so we find a progressive warning concerning deception. In verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you. Individual man deceive individual you. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now it's not just a man deceiving another man, but it's those who, are, uh, who, who present themselves as if they are the Messiah. And, you know, Jesus told them that uh, I come in my name and you receive me not. There'll be one that comes in his old name and you will receive him. So this is going to be a time of great deception. Uh, and then in verse number 11, 
and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And then it goes from deceive you to deceiving many and then to limits beyond what you can imagine in verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs, plural, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, and thank God for this next phrase, if it were possible, they shall deceive whom? The very, the very elect of God. This, this deception of God abandoning a previously used and sanctioned uh, religious order is, is, is strong, is powerful. God gets in on it. That's kind of stupid to say that. There's nothing God's not in on. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. But the deception is well described by God here to the disciples because God is going to be the one that's going to send uh, the strongest of the delusions. He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, the mystery of iniquity does already work. The hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority, somebody said. I like that, so I wrote it down. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. God's going to have to handle him and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. With how much deceivableness of unrighteousness? All. Oh, this is going to be strong. The beginning of the Christian age is going to uh, be a reoccurrence of uh, the uh, beginning of the new revelation of God by the Holy Spirit and it will prosper and grow until it apostatizes and moves on to the next place. And it will continue to do that all the way around the world. And when this deceivableness comes, God is going to not only permit but ordain that it would be all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now, what's the problem? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What will save a soul? The love of the truth. Now, verse 11 is what I've been trying to get to. And for this cause, God shall send. When he says, I'm not going to have a stone left on another in Jerusalem, he meant it. And dear soul, uh, I know the wrath of man uh, James says does not does not praise God, uh, but uh, the the the, uh, the remainder of wrath he said he shall restrain. Uh, God is in control of everything. Uh, in Romans chapter nine verses twenty two and twenty three, God clearly tells us that whether uh, there are those that He has uh, uh, ordained to be saved by His grace are those that he has just suffered long with and going to allow the wrath of God to fall on them, every one of them are going to bring praise and honor and glory to God. Hell is not without its responsibility to magnify and glorify God. This gospel hadn't been heard in our land for 200 years almost. It's, people have got some little concept of... Uh, <clears throat> Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus save, Jesus save. Okay, bring my nephew in here, my, my grandson, whatever, and they get saved. Okay, that's fine. And they, they think that they have a, a promise of eternal salvation when they don't even know who God is. Salvation is a revelation of the person of God. And this God is going to be glorified in the damnation of the wicked as much as he's going to be glorified in the salvation of his elect. So th this, brings, this brings out an awareness of God that just being honest with you, religion in our day doesn't want to hear about. They don't want to know about. We don't want to know this God, you know. 
We like our little propped up Jesus, our little concept of God, the God of our imagination. But don't be talking to me about a God who is so sovereign and so absolutely glorious in his holiness that even his wrath is pure and holy and precious and perfect. That's amazing, isn't it? So we see that this deception is going to be great. <clears throat> so it says, uh, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. Why? Number one, that they might, but that they should believe a lie. And number two, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we see that the Lord Jesus begins to tell them about the deception that's coming. And the reason that the deception is going to be greater, it's because the revelation of God is greater. And as the light is given uh, to a, a greater degree, uh, then the responsibility to receive and accept that light is also heightened. And, and their soul, the angel of light comes to imitate all that he can of God, and God assists him to do so. And the Lord said, uh, he just washed his hands of them here and says, you know, uh, you shall remain in your sin. You, you, you can't uh, follow me. You shall die in your sins. Look at John chapter 8 and verse number 21. This is not some little hippie preacher riding a donkey uh, making some little statement to a few little isolated people. This is God Almighty talking to his creation who have determined not to res respond to him or believe on him. And so if he's no respecter of persons, so if he says this to any religious order, he says it to all of them. John chapter 8, verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. You remember that, that verse in Isaiah, Seek ye the Lord, how? While he may be found. And, and God said in another place, They shall go with their flocks and their herds to seek me and shall not find me. I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, what's he going to do, commit suicide? Because he says, whether I go, ye cannot come. And he saith unto them, now listen, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. That's powerful stuff. You say, well, don't read me over there in Romans chapter 9. That's just too powerful. Well, that's pretty powerful right here. And this is what our nation today doesn't want to hear this. We call ourselves one nation under God and and. Uh, we, we think that we are a Christian nation. We're anything but that. We are a religious nation. I understand that. But people don't want to hear about the God that's presented to us by the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures. And he begins to warn them. Take heed, take heed, take heed. Why? Deceive you, deceive many, deceive many, deceive the very elect if it were possible. This thing's going to go so far that it's going to it, it, I'm going to have to restrain it from deceiving the elect. That's how powerful it's going to be. Dear soul, I'll tell you what, I was thinking on the way over here tonight. Lord, I sure am thankful my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I wouldn't take anything in the world for that. And I don't want to miss any of my blessings. I want to thank you, and I appreciate that song tonight, that second verse. That guy expressed my very heart as I, as I was trying to come over here tonight. But I said, Lord, I don't want to miss any of my blessings. I want to give you thanksgiving for all of them. But the very thing, if I could only say one, 
is that you have come to an unworthy sinner and put yourself in my place and redeemed me by thy grace. That's the greatest thing that could ever happen to a man. And there's so, you know, how, why are there any that are saved? It's only by the sovereign, absolute grace of God Almighty determining to have a people for himself. And so it goes through all of this uh, <clears throat> so that uh, those who want to, uh, to have their own God and, and they've turned it around instead of man being created in, God, in God's image, now they're creating God in their image. And, and the Lord's going to allow it to be done. And it, it just continues on and on. But it's a new era here now. There's something entirely different. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul labors to, to show them at the uh, Corinthian church, both Jew and Gentile, what God has done now and how different it is from that which it once was up to this point. They'd only had uh, the old economy and the Old Testament and so forth. And the Apostle Paul is literally, literally writing our Bible as he writes to these churches and begins to explain and express and to preach and to discern uh, that which he has gotten from God so that they'd understand what kind of world the Christian world is in. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some other others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation uh, from you. I'm not going to have letters of recommendation, natural physical letters written on paper. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts. It's a spiritual letter known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Listen, it's not even in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. It's not going to be like it was. It's not going to be uh, Moses on the mount with God's finger appearing to write in stone. It's now going to be the spirit of the living God come to write himself in you. He's going to write his name on your forehead. You're going to be uh, known. Your headship is going to be Christ. Uh, you, you're going to have uh, the ability, and I appreciate the prayer tonight, Lord, let us worship, uh, to worship God with your mind. Uh, love thinketh no evil. We're going to be able to have the mind of Christ, his name written upon our, mind, our heads and on our hands. It's going to be that which we, in, in, uh, we involve ourselves in. The work of, of our hearts is to, be, uh, to come to know him more completely and more fully. It's not going to be like it was. This is all new, a whole new era. Verse 4, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. How are you going to prove it? I can't prove it. I don't have any papers. Uh, we can't go and, and watch and see this as the Declaration of Independence is sealed under safety glass and it's kept at certain temperatures and it's watched over and made sure that it doesn't uh, uh, degenerate. Paul doesn't have any letters. You don't have any letters. I don't have any letters. We don't have any stone to chisel this in. It's in the heart. It's new. It's different. It's progressing on to who God is. But everybody wants to stay behind. We want physical. We want literal. We want, we, 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 we want flags and banners and marches and, you know, we want pledges and salutes and all that kind of stuff. But this all it's a it's a intimate communication more so than that. It's a communion with the essence of God in his glory. That's where you're headed. And that's how he starts us out. It's entirely different. So what do you have to prove what you're saying, Paul? Our trust 
that we have in this is such as we only have through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. I, you can't depend on the apostle. Oh, well, you know, I am a Paul or I'm of a Paul. No. You got to say your sufficiency is God. You know, a brother came to me last week and he said, I did a bad thing uh, several months back or whatever how long it was. And he said, I attempted uh, to say whether this other person was uh, was born again or not. He said, that's none of my business and I don't even, I don't know. And I'm sorry I said it. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm through with all that. I'm not, who am I to say who is and who is not? And that's the truth. It's amazing. They are born of the Spirit. Listen, our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, the new testament. Is it on paper? No. Do you have a contract? Yeah, but it's not where you can go to the vault and get it out and look at it. Uh, it's by faith. The just shall live by faith. Why, why did he give you faith? Because everything you look at is invisible that has anything to do with eternality. While we look not at the things which are seen, uh, but we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are only temporary. But the things which are not seen or deathless, one interpretation says, and that's the truth. Why did he create the world? We know that by the creation of the world, the invisible things of God are clearly seen. Even his power and his Godhead. You ever got into that? You ever thought about that? Have you ever seen a rock or a bird or a stick or, or a rabbit? And said, Lord, how does that show your Godhead? Have you ever got into those words? That's amazing. Showing God's Godhead through the natural order. Man, took some shirts to the laundry this morning. A little old girl like froze to death opening that window to take them in the door, take them in the window. And I looked over there while she was in there writing up the ticket or whatever they do. And there was a great big old red hawk sitting up in a little old scrubby oak tree. It didn't even look like the whole tree was enough to hold him up. And I said, my soul. And I told her about it, and I said, watch this. I'm going to drive up under that tree. It's right, on the, right where the curb was. And I, and I said, he'll fly off, and you'll get to see his wingspan. Shoot. He didn't move nothing. <laughs> I drove up under that tree, and he just sat there. So I took his picture. <laughs> I don't care whether he likes it or not. And I said, Lord. That's amazing. I told her, I said, he can't, that hawk came to show you his respects today. But I thought more about in my own heart about how God let me start off a day seeing an amazing creature like that. And that's just one little, little excuse me, bird, one little stupid bird. I mean, good grief, what are you doing? I, there's more in me than I can get out. It's the essence of glory is ours, folks. You need to tend to that which is invisible. All the rest of this stuff is going to take care of itself. One thing that you're going to learn as you grow older, priorities. You will get to it sooner or later, but not in the order that the flesh wants you to. We've got to hurry up and do this, got to do this. Got to. Your younger generation will think you done turned senile. But you hadn't. You just learned not to get all shook up about stuff that you used to get all shook up about. And you know what? All that stuff don't matter to me no more. And I, 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 have, I have a yearning. I have a longing. I, I have a hunger to get on. I, the devil brings up my past sin, and I have seen what a moron I've been in my life and how many mistakes I've made. He constantly brings that up to me, but I always say, I'm sorry, buddy, but I ain't looking back. I'm looking under Jesus. I've got a ways to go, and I don't intend to stop now.
It's amazing. He said, it's God that has made us able ministers of the New Testament. And he says again, not of the letter, not of stone, not of pen, not of paper, has made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 4.20, is not in word, but in power. But if the ministration of death, graven, written and engraven in stone, was glorious, and it was, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. Why? For the glory of Moses' countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Now listen at verse 10. For even that which was made glorious, that is the old economy, stones, God's finger, had no, glorious in, had no glory in this respect. What made Moses and his law to have no glory? It was in this respect. By reason of the glory that excelleth. What glory is there. It's the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've ever seen him, he'll draw you into him. <clears throat> For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away with glorious much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now, how many things are we talking about? Number one, that which was done away. All right, that's one. What's the other? All right, next, that which remaineth. How many things are that? Two. Then why are people saying they, they are three different dispensations? The Bible speaks only of the old and the new. There was the natural, now there is the spiritual, and it's all designed to bring us into the glorious, and that's it. Seeing that then that we have such hope, we use plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. You know, uh, I was talking to uh, somebody out there Sunday uh, in the in the coffee shop, I mean the dining hall, and uh, they were the two people were talking to each other, and one of them put their hand up over their mouth, and I looked at the other one. And I said, "Can you understand what they're saying?" They said, "No, not with their hand up over their mouth." And and I thought about this verse: Moses had that veil over his face. And you couldn't see his mouth, and you might as well forget it. If I can't see your mouth and you don't stand in front of me talking to me, you know, I may hear you say something entirely different than what you enunciated. He said, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not, in this word you need to be sure and get it, steadfastly looked to the end of that, which is what? They couldn't even look to the fullness of that which was going to be abolished. Why? Because even that that was going to be discarded and superseded by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who built the house, uh, it, that that even had a veil over it so that you couldn't even fully understand it even while it was temporarily existing. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, listen, which veil is done away in Christ. That right there is exactly what was going on in Matthew 23, 37 through 24, whatever the end of the verse, the end of the chapter is. They could not see him. 
God was through. It was over. It was done. He's going to continue to do that. We've already seen it as the husband in John 15 and verse 1 who purges the vine and cuts back that dead stuff and purges that church. It is, it is seen in God saying, I will remove your candlestick in the book of the Revelation. He is constantly pruning and purging and moving on. And it's moving fast into eternity, folks. So their minds were blinded, and what will take away the veil? Christ. But even unto this day, th th this is several years after what happened in Matthew 24, but even unto this day, when Paul was writing this, when Moses is read, the veil is still upon their hearts. You see what a difference, you see what a change, you see what a new era it was? Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Again, Christ is going to do away with the veil. If God brings it to himself, then they will see the Lord. Now, the Lord is that spirit. He is that spirit that takes the veil away. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a mirror, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Listen, next two words. Here's what happens. This is what sets you forth. This is what establishes how your Christian life will be from the moment of your conception all the way into eternity. The next two words. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. What's the next two words? Isn't that something? What happens when a man gets saved? You say, well, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new, right? Then what was it that changed them? Saw the glory. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cain of Galilee and manifest forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. John 2.11 are changed in the same image, and how long does it continue? It is that which establishes, first of all, your regeneration. You're changed from death unto life, and then you progress on in a progressive sanctification into the same image from one degree of glory to the next higher degree of glory. That is the essence of all of your experience in Christ. Seeing Christ is glorious in your heart. Not the practice of religion. Not memorizing the books of the Bible. But seeking Christ. They are they which testify of me. My Bible used to be precious to me because I went to church. But now my Bible is precious to me because in there I find the Lord Jesus Christ. Revealed by the Holy Spirit. I don't have the physical, literal, like Moses and the veil and the stone and the finger of God writing and all of that. I don't even have a piece of paper with it written down. How do you know that you know? Our trust is of you is through Christ to Godward. It's all by faith. It's all by the Spirit. And it comes with an open face. Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Now I begin to begin. Now I begin to know what the first Adam knew. He walked with God and saw his glory. And I begin to see what it's like to be able to look at the animals of this world and to name them and to understand not with severity of judgment or with criticism but with the awareness of there's something different about me that's what Adam had happened to him Lord there's no help meet for me there's something different about me I'm, I'm, I'm without the other bookend you know uh, we're supposed to be a set I feel that but there's only one of me. There's only supposed to be a set. You and Christ. 
And now you've seen the glory. <clears throat> and you begin to name all the animals. You begin to see the sows and the dogs and the sheep. You begin to perceive and understand and discern why? Because this glory has changed you. We've established that. It's new. It's a new era. And you begin to perceive, and there's a spirit of discernment about you, and you have a consciousness beyond your reason and beyond your logic, and things, uh, you know, they, they begin to dawn on you. Can I use that term? God begins to reveal himself to and through and in and by you. And you're changed into that image from one degree of glory to another until the Spirit of the Lord brings you to the understanding that I am only complete in Jesus Christ. God said, you know what? He's right. It is not good for the man to be alone. But I, want him to, I wanted him to feel his loneliness. I wanted him to name that animal, that, that desperate sense of being unfulfilled. I wanted him to know what the gnaw of hunger was so that he can see the blessedness of being filled. I wanted him to see and feel and understand. And he's got to say it to me. There is no help fit for me. And the Lord said, okay, boys, we've got to do something about this. It is not good for the man to live alone. And I'm going to tell you something. You can go to Hollywood <clears throat> or whoever, and you can get your concept of uh, companionship wherever you want from whatever degree in whatever areas you think it ought to be in, if you want to. But not a single human being will ever be satisfied or fulfilled except they come to Christ. Never. The world says, you know, we just don't love each other anymore. What they mean is that initial fire of sexual attraction has burned low. And it wasn't love to start with, it was lust. But I'm going to tell you something. If you'll read the description of God in 1 Corinthians 13, you'll find out God who is love, he never faileth, seeketh not his own, is not puffed up, he's kind. He believeth all things and endureth all things. Dear soul, he hopeth all things in you. And you'll never find satisfaction and wholesome completion until you find it in Christ. There. Okay, here's up. Y'all get your saw out. I'm fixing to go out on a limb. You can cut it off behind me if you want to. I don't believe in my mind and heart there has ever been a 100% completion in the heart of a man or a woman in their, in their marriage like there is in the believer to Christ. I'm not saying there's not good marriages, and I'm not saying they're not Christian marriages, and I'm not saying people uh, have not been really blessed and richly blessed because of union with their mates. But I'm saying this. Everything falls short of the richness of the oneness in Christ. The man and woman are made one flesh, but the spirit or the soul of man and God are made one spirit. That's a higher order, folks. That's what they were going into. We're going into a higher order. It's 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 spiritual. It it's not written down. It's it's not formula. It's not. You know, you, you can't just say, uh, one, two, three, you know, this way you do it, uh, A, B, C, D, this, this is the steps, it's got to do it. It's an organism. It's a richness of faith that sees the invisible. 
You've got to come to that which you cannot identify. You've got to come to that which you specially cannot define. You're, you're coming to that by faith, trusting in God. And that's what he said. I don't have any ability to, to sustain this in a court of law, but our trust is through Christ to God for you. Isn't that amazing? God, God is, is really amazing. I love Romans 8, 3. Do you? So what does it say? Well, turn over and we'll see. <clears throat> For what the law could not do. Why could it not do it? In that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, we got a precedent. Number one, what, what is stated? There was something the law could not do. Number two, why was it not able to do that? Because of the flesh. All right, then the next one is, then what flesh is there that will be able to fulfill the law? We're going backwards now. We got one and then A, now we got A and then two, you know. I don't know how to explain that to you. For what the law could not do, there was something the law could not do. Why? It was weak through the flesh. All right, what are we going to do about that flesh? We're going to have to have God to send His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. All right, so the opposite of the first part of verse 3 is the first part of verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. See? Who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. you got the whole Old and New Testament in those two verses. Who gave the law? God did. We just read it about Moses, the, you know, the finger and the stone and all that stuff. All right. So the law in Romans chapter 7, holy and just and good. Nothing wrong with the law. It's that flesh can't keep the law. All right. Then what we're going to do about the flesh? The only flesh that ever kept the law was God sending his son outside of and from eternal glory into the human race and fulfill the law in his flesh for us. And now what's the, what's the last part of it? It is now the righteousness of the law is fulfilling us. You can't say that the law can't do any more in the Christian because God is seeing to it that the righteousness of the law, not just the morality of the law, and the thing that always brings a religion to darkness is separating the laws into individual commands and not seeing the law as the expression of the character of God as one whole. The Bible tells us, break one and you broke them all. What does that mean? If you don't know me, has I been so long with you, Philip, and thou hast not known me? If you don't know me in this and you don't know me at all, you, it's, it's the richness of God manifesting himself. You say, it's more than I can comprehend. Good. I wouldn't want a God that I could understand. I don't even have a computer I can understand or an automobile. Why should I have a God that I can understand? But I know one thing. You match that little old button right there, and it warms up the steering wheel, and I don't have to wear gloves, and I don't have to wait till the car gets hot. And there's another one up there you can mash, and whoo, the seat begins to get warm, and you have to kind of turn it down a little bit. At least you know, on my side, on the other side, I don't think it ever gets warm enough. But anyhow, if you got a God that you can understand, you ain't got God. This, that's what we're, the whole essence of this thing is that God is not going to be remade in the image of man. He walks out of that as soon as you get to the place to where you think you got God cornered. God said, see you later, sweet potato. I'm out of here. Not one stone will be left upon another. 
That's why people say, what are we going to do in heaven? And I say, well, if that's what you think about heaven, you may not even be going there because I don't think you're identifying it right. If I have learned anything, it's what God says in, to Moses, what it was, Exodus 3.14. What's your name? I am that which I am doing. No, that's the Baptist God. <clears throat> that's a religious practice, religious theology God. No, I am that I am. What would you say? Well, I would say I am that which I am being, if I had to say. I don't want to add to it, but to define it, I wouldn't say I am that that I am doing, but I am that I am being. So what is your goal, Mr. Christian. It is to come to be. To be what? No, no, no. Don't mess it up. It is to come to be. I know blank I have believed and I am persuaded that blank is able what do you think? What's those blanks? Mm -hmm. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. It ain't us committing unto them. It's you personally facing and addressing and dealing with the essence of eternal glory. And don't intend to keep yourself when you do it because it's going to suck you into it. That's what heaven is. It is being brought into the awareness, Father, I will, that you would love them the way you've loved me. And I will that you would cause them to be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Wait a minute then. Since he said that, it's not that I will that they be with me where I am. So let's get out the compass and, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff and figure out the longitude and latitude and marching. It's not place. It's condition of being. I will that they be with me where I am. As soon as we hear where I am, he said, where is he? I, I got a GPS. I got a Garmin. I got a Tom Tom. I'll punch it in, and we'll find him. No, 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 no. See, this is a new era. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This, this ain't like it. This is not like anything you've ever known. It's not long, longitude and latitude that they may be with me, but that they may be absorbed in me and I in them, that they may be one in us as I am one in thee. Did you ever stop and think about that? That they may be one with us as I, Christ, am one with you, Father. My goodness. That they may behold my glory. Not just be in the same room with me. That's not what we're talking about. It is a being in the manifestation of the glory of God. Mm. Why do men cringe when they get in the presence of angels? Why did uh, Manoah tell his wife uh, after the angel had said, you're going to have a, a son? Why did he tell her, so they, yeah, we're going to die, we've seen God? She said, silly boy. Us women have to really talk to these men, don't we? Silly boy, if God was going to kill us, he would have already done it. <laughs> right, ladies, amen. Got your chance, say it. Why was he saying? Why should redeemed people 
cringe in the presence of angels. They're here looking at us to find out what's going on, which things the angels desire to look into. There's only one reason. It's not that we're not as holy as they are. It's not that we're not in the in a, not in as close a union with God as they are. We are. It's that we never have been brought into the change from one degree of glory to another to come to the place to where we're comfortable with that last state of glory where Christ is required to come back and be among us. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear. Physical appearance. He had to appear for me to be justified, but not physically. He appears constantly for me to be continuously sanctified, progressively so, but not physically. But in that last degree of glory, he will have to come and manifest himself physically so that we might be like him when we literally, physically, then. Not by just the eye of faith like we have had to be all along in justification and sanctification, but in glorification we shall literally, physically see him as he is. And that's going to change us and no more will we be cringing in the presence of angels. The only difference has been all along that they stand in, an, in the order of a created glory and we are in the progression of a redemptive glory where God is determining to raise us up and make us his bride and he be our head and we become one spiritually forever. Dear folks, I, I don't think anybody really realizes what is in store for us. I don't think we could possibly throw in the towel and quit as much as we do if we knew just what it meant to destroy that temple. I got about two more hours worth of stuff. I'm going to have to quit again. <clears throat> but I want to say this. If you will study your, your Bible, you will find that each gospel era ends in a God-sent darkness. Um, let's see if I can find that verse. Second Timothy we got to go. My time is gone. Second Timothy 3. I don't know if this is it or not. One or not. Yeah. It are. Second Timothy 3, 13. But evil men and seducers shall... Give me another word for wax. Grow. Grow. Worse and worse. And listen, deceiving, what does that mean? Other people. But listen, and being deceived. As they use and are used by the powers of darkness to deceive others, it deceives them as well. Make sure you understand that if the light of religion in anyone is darkness, how great is that darkness? It is then impossible to renew them again unto salvation. You can't unring the bell. They now are sows in the mud hole, wallowing in their lust, or dogs licking up the vomit that is that which they cast off and said, I'm going to live morally, I ain't doing this no more. They're right back in it. And dear soul, that, 
that darkness, this is condemnation. It's so funny. The next word's going to be light. And th this is condemnation. That light is coming to the world. How does that? Looks like that'd be great. This is condemnation. That light is coming into the world. Ah, but men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Light received with a darkness loving heart will fit one for eternal darkness. And every generation of the gospel era as it goes around the world fits some to go into the glory of the warming light of God and others they already have inner darkness so they cast them into outer darkness. So hell is the last place and the darkness shall be so great, the Bible said they'll gnaw their tongue for the pain. And that doesn't start when the man dies. It starts when the gospel is preached to him, and it begins right there at that second, as either bringing him to light and glory or bringing him to damnation and darkness. That's what the Lord was talking about here. I don't feel like I've done any good in trying to expound these verses because we really hadn't. I'm trying to show you the, the spirit of the chapter. And I don't know where we're going next. But I want you to understand God turns his back and walks away from religion when it ceases to glorify him. And you've got example after example after example of it. You say, well, that book of the Revelation was written to the seven churches of Asia. Go find them. <clears throat> and here we are. This is our turn. And may God have mercy on us that we'd walk with God for his glory, Brother Ed. <laughs>